Coming up, we're bringing you an entirely new show on Professor of Rock, and man, I'm really excited about this one. It's a new way for this channel to go in-depth into the greatest artists and bands and their most sensational songs. And today, we're featuring five defining tracks that capture the essence of the most iconic rock band in the history of iconic rock bands. That's right, we're starting big. These five songs will rearrange anybody's mind. The evolution of the Lords of Rock through five songs that define their essence, including one so powerful it scared the hell out of the guitarist and it made the singer weep after he sang the vocal. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember when New Coke came out and you just long for the original taste, you're gonna dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Of course, you wouldn't have to wait too long because Classic Coke came out right after that. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the bell so you always know when our latest interviews and videos are coming out. I apologize, I got a little bit of a cold here, so bear with me. But I'm really, really excited about today's uh, topic. It's time for the series premiere, a new show here on Professor of Rock. We're calling it Evolution. On this show, we tell the story of a band's career through five defining tracks, each one specifically chosen to tell a band's story from beginning to end, uh, you know, showcasing the evolution of their sound and their artistic direction. We'll talk band origins and cover that one breakout hit, the song, you know, that put them on the map. As we dive further into the band's growth, we'll often feature tracks that have become standards in the rock canon. Some might be chart toppers, other consensus radio classics. Sometimes we'll throw in a hidden gem that just can't be ignored, you know, because they're so vital to the band's story. And then we'll round it all out by giving you each band's swan song or career closer, that one final look at what they evolved into. It's gonna be really fun. Uh, you'll have to let me know what yours are. The idea here is to emphasize each growth and direction and not merely assemble a greatest hits collection. So to help keep the focus on the journey, we're imposing a limit of just one song per album. A little rule there. Uh, now these are my choices. I really want to know your choices in the comments after we get through with this. Uh, so let us know. Now for our inaugural episode, we're kicking things off the right way. We're going to tell the tale of the mighty Lords of Rock, Led Zeppelin. Honestly, this might be an impossible task. I'm not sure if I can tell Zeppelin's story in just five songs, but we're going for it anyway. All right, here we go. Let's get into it. So when you're looking at Led Zeppelin, what you're really looking at is the blueprint for the quintessential rock band, period. This fiery foursome, you know, they have the charismatic heavy rock frontman and Robert Plant. They have the guitar virtuoso and undisputed musical genius in Jimmy Page. And then the quiet but highly talented bassist and keyboardist in John Paul Jones and the ruckus and audacious drumming in legend John Bonzo Bonham. No doubt these guys set the bar for everybody. They were provocative, innovative, powerful, and revolutionary. Rising out of the remains of a high-flying 60s rock band, the Yardbirds, Jimmy Page assembled Led Zeppelin with the help of manager Peter Grant in the summer of 1968. Beginning as a new incarnation of his former band, he called the group the New Yardbirds, pulling in session musician John Paul Jones and Band of Joy bandmates uh, Robert Plant and John Bonham. These four rockers were soon going by the name Led Zeppelin, which was prompted by a quip about uh, going down like a lead balloon. Now, before I give you these five tracks, I do want to recognize today's sponsor, Babbel. You know, I didn't take any foreign language classes in school, but as I've gotten older, I wish I had. I would love to learn to speak fluent Spanish as I meet people quite frequently that speak Spanish, and there's, you know, a language barrier. I also love the idea of challenging myself and encouraging my children to learn other languages. In 2024, I set a goal to do something about my desire to learn Spanish, and fortunately, I discovered Babbel one of the top language learning apps in the world. What I really like about Babbel is that their language lessons will prepare me for having natural and practical conversations in a foreign language. It's very exciting to me. It's very easy to download the app and set up a lesson plan that works for your life schedule. Click on the link below to get 60% off your Babbel subscription and start speaking a new language in just three weeks. You know, from the start, Zeppelin's unique sound drew upon the wide-ranging musical interests of its members. 
initially blues-based in structure. It was the band's creative interpretation of the genre that pointed them in the direction of legendary status. Hitting on some serious sonic sorcery, Led Zeppelin mixed blues licks into hard-hitting rock songs. And audiences have remained under their spell ever since then. Dazed and confused, so long it's not true. The Foursome's historic debut album, also titled Led Zeppelin, was released on January 12, 1969. Climbed to number six in the UK and it went to number 10 here in the US. Zeppelin won, simultaneously won the adulation of fans and the scorn of the music press. A dichotomy that would persist throughout the band's career, really. Regardless of the naysayers, though, Zeppelin's debut would go on to sell over 13 million copies worldwide. This is in no small part thanks to their breakthrough track and the first of our five songs, Good Times, Bad Times. Good times, bad times, you know I had my share. You know, not only was Good Times, Bad Times the opening track on the first Led Zeppelin album, it was also the band's introductory single, which meant that for many original generation Zeppelin fans, this song was the official introduction to this band. It was just the perfect way to fire off Zeppelin's storied career. Ah, such a great song. Good Times, Bad Times, it was initially called A Man I Know, and it was written shortly before the start of the sessions for the group's debut album. Three out of the four bandmates are credited as songwriters on this track, uh, Jimmy Page, John Bonham, and John Paul Jones. Jimmy Page, who loved to shower acclaim on his vocalist, said this about Robert Plant in those times. Robert was absolutely extraordinary in those days. He was so bombastic and fearless that neither the songs nor the studio intimidated him at all. He very quickly got to a point where no other singer could touch him. There's just no doubt that Good Times, Bad Times fits that assessment for Plant. From the outset, Plant's voice commands our attention. High-pitched and energetic, you can virtually credit Plant alone for establishing the vocal standard for future hard rock bands, all of them. Page also explained that Good Times, Bad Times came out of a riff that uh, basically knocked everyone sideways when they first heard it. Jonesy's bass playing on the track, it's nothing short of exceptional and throwing Bonzo's talents on the kit. And this track basically put the world on notice that there was an elite rhythm section in town. No Look, if Zeppelin only had one chance to convince you that they were top tier and you dropped the needle on good times, bad times, it says it all. This is the song that kicked it all off and from there led Zeppelin, they never looked back. Good Times, Bad Times is a gateway track into the brilliance that is Led Zeppelin. First song on the first album, how can you tell the story of Zeppelin without this one? You can feel the within my heart. Okay, so let's keep it going. Throughout 1969, the band paid their dues with a steady barrage of tour dates. They played their way across North America and England. And during this time of intense touring, they began recording their follow-up album uh, with no time really to catch their breath at all, Zeppelin jetted in and out of studios and across continents between April and August of 69. The result, Led Zeppelin II, that was released in October of 69. Uh, this was just a year into their tenure, uh, and the fame and the reputation of this band, it was just skyrocketing. Even before two hit the shelves, the follow-up set racked up, uh, I think it was 500,000 pre-orders, and fans would not be disappointed when they got their hands on this finished product. Led Zeppelin II was and is a beast of an album. Filled to the brim with classic rock standards and leading the way is today's second track, my second choice, The Evolutionary, A Whole Lot of Love. Built on the framework of the blues tune You Need Love by Willie Dixon, which was then released by Muddy Waters as a single in 63. I know you need love. You just got to have love. Whole Lot of Love was originally credited to all the members of Zeppelin. Uh, bursting from the artistry of Jimmy Page, who came up with one of the most commanding riffs in all of rock history here. Whole Lot of Love is Led Zeppelin's first undisputed classic song for sure. 
It's a legitimate contender for the song that invented heavy metal. I know we've put a lot of songs forth in the last few months on that, but it's a sonic sledgehammer, driving and pounding with undeniable force and swagger. It stormed the charts and became Zeppelin's biggest hit. Went all the way to number four, and it sounded like nothing anyone had ever heard before, especially on pop radio. Said Paige about it, and I quote, I suppose my early love for big intros by rockabilly guitarists was an inspiration, but as soon as I developed the riff, I knew it was strong enough to drive the entire song, not just open it. When I played the riff for the band in my living room several weeks later during rehearsals for our first album, the excitement was immediate and collective. We felt the riff was addictive, like a forbidden thing. Of course, much of the appeal of A Whole Lot of Love is its forbidden nature, as well as preoccupation with sex, right? Plant's blazing performance, though, it embodies the latter. Way, way down inside, I'm gonna give you my love, he sings, I'm gonna give you every inch of my love. Uh huh, <laughs> yeah. Whole Lot of Love was another rare single for this band, though. Um, they didn't release a lot of singles, it was a huge one. Released worldwide in November of 69, except uh, in the UK. Its number four placing on the Hot 100 was one thing. It also hit number two on the Cashbox chart. Uh, it brought the band's monster sound to the larger top 40 AM radio audience, for sure. And it's turned in just under a billion streams in the new millennium. A Whole lot of Love remains one of Zeppelin's most popular songs, and I don't think anyone can argue that this isn't one of Zeppelin's essential defining tracks. So skipping ahead to Led Zeppelin's untitled fourth album, often referred to as Four, amongst other names. This one, of course, released in November of 71, and it might be their masterpiece. Um, not only is Four uh, one of the top-selling albums in history, having sold between 32 and 40 million copies worldwide, depending on where you look, it's also one of the most revered albums ever. Zeppelin IV is stacked with so many iconic tracks. Black Dog, Rock and Roll, When the Levee Breaks. But when it comes down to it, I mean, you have to put Stairway to Heaven on this exclusive list of just five tracks. How can you not? Overplayed or not, Stairway is the inarguable granddaddy of Zeppelin's catalog. Um, really the granddaddy of any catalog. It's the greatest classic rock song ever, probably. Certainly the most played song ever. The one song people that, you know, don't even know Zeppelin associate with Zeppelin. An unknowable song characterized by a forbidden riff. Hey. Stairway to Heaven is an unparalleled standard. Although Stairway to Heaven is the achievement of the entire band, really the credit for the song's premise, that once again goes to the great Jimmy Page. Uh, he started writing it in early 1970. Musically, Stairway contains a broad sweep of styles in the nearly eight minute journey from its quiet pastoral intro to its heart pounding conclusion. Stairway blends a steady stream of folk and hard rock and progressive elements just Truly, truly a work of art. Stairway has, of course, captured the imagination of every generation since it was released. Though some have claimed to have solved the riddle of its lyrics, no one can say for sure what it means, not even the authors. Um, even Robert Plant, who's repeatedly been asked about its meaning, has really offered no definitive interpretation. The writing of the song was almost something of a supernatural experience. Said Plant about it, I was holding a pencil and paper all of a sudden, my hand was writing out the words. There's a lady, is sure, all that glitters is gold, and she's buying a stairway to heaven. Buying the stairway to heaven. Robert Plant just sat there and looked at the words. He almost leaped out of his seat. After the words just continued to flow, it was done very quickly, is what Plant would tell Cameron Crowe in an interview. It took a little working out, but it was a very fluid unnaturally easy track. There was just something pushing it, saying, you guys are okay, but if you want to do something timeless, here's a wedding song for you. <laughs> we all know what happened after Zeppelin released their fourth album, Rock and Roll Change Forever. Soaring from the record's insane popularity, Led Zeppelin punched their ticket to rock immortality. But in keeping with the band's evolutionary mindset, they vowed 
never to repeat themselves. And that's what the magic was with this band, always with. To heaven. Their next album, House of the Holy, featured a multiplicity of genres. Prog rock, reggae, funk, folk, psychedelic, Indian. But as innovative as Houses of the Holy was and is, we're actually going to move on to Zeppelin's sixth album, Physical Graffiti, for our next one. Released in February of 75, this four-sided vinyl is a stone-cold classic, boasting 15 tracks and over 80 minutes of runtime. Uh, Zeppelin, they were firing on all cylinders on this one, gathering at Headley Range in Hampshire in early 1974. Their creative energy it was just flowing. In these sessions, they were working long hours, and they laid down eight new tracks, which totaled a runtime of about 53 minutes. Too long for a single record. Refusing to cut any of the songs, the band collected seven more tracks previously written, and they turned physical graffiti into an eternal contender for the best double album of all time. And you know, when you're talking physical graffiti, the record's indisputable crown jewel is, of course, Cashmere, our next track. This track's origins go back to 1973 when Robert Plant and Jimmy Page were trekking through the Sahara Desert in Morocco. Actually, their destination was the Folklore Festival in Marrakesh. Would you know where I'd be on the Marrakesh Express? Initially, it was titled Driving to Kashmir. Plant said of the song's origins, and I quote, I kept bumping down a desert track and there was nobody for miles, except a guy on a camel. The whole inspiration for the song came from the fact that the road went on and on and on. It was a single track road which cut neatly through the desert. I thought, this is great, but one day, Kashmir. That's my Shangri-La. Kashmir is absolutely transcendent. Boy, is Plant right there. Nothing else sounds or feels like this song. It possesses a unique spiritual quality that really few, if any, rock songs have ever approached, let alone achieved. It is a metaphysical masterpiece. Powerful and awe-inspired. At one point, Robert Plant even called it the definitive Led Zeppelin song. It's just hard to argue with that assessment, which is why I've included it here. When Jimmy Page heard the finished version of Kashmir, he admitted that he was frightened by the song's haunting intensity. He was scared of it. He knew the band had created something truly incredible. Robert Plant, too, found the song really intimidating. What began as being a song about a pilgrimage evolved into a series of intensely illuminated moments. Robert Plant felt that Kashmir was bigger than he was. He was petrified to perform the vocal, confiding that he was virtually in tears. Uh, the song instantly mesmerized his author by bursting directly into that riveting melody without any setup. I am a traveler of all time and space. Even with this 8 minute 37 second runtime, Kashmir secured extensive airplay in both the U.S. and the United Kingdom on the release of uh, Physical Graffiti. And since then, its preeminent position on classic rock radio has never been questioned. Boasting over 600 million streams on YouTube and Spotify, this one clearly remains a total favorite. Truly one of Zeppelin's essential tracks, if not their essential track, right there with Stairway. Ooh, my baby. Ooh, my baby. So by 1977, Zeppelin had issued seven multi-platinum studio albums, five of which topped the charts here in America. And after having uh, created some of the hardest hitting tracks of the past decade, Led Zeppelin had more than secured their status as rock's, really their measuring rod. But the close of the 70s was an era of musical upheaval for everybody. I mean, you had the last gasps of disco, you have the rise of soft rock, now called yacht rock, and of course, punk transitioning to post-punk and new wave. There was a strange mixture of music on the airwaves, and Zeppelin found themselves uh, reaching for some things. And Zeppelin themselves, they added to this eclectic mix with an unexpected contribution to the late 70s, which is going to be our final track here, Fool in the Rain. This one comes from their eighth and final studio album in Through the Outdoor. We just covered it in detail. 
a few months ago. Released on August 15, 1979, In Through the Outdoor was really a unique departure from all of its predecessors. In contrast to previous Zeppelin records, this one was heavily influenced by John Paul Jones, who had a hand in composing nearly every track uh, with the help of his new Yamaha GX1 synthesizer. This is what he, uh, he actually nicknamed it the Dream Machine. With keyboards at the forefront, In Through the Outdoor was a surprise addition to the Zeppelin catalog. Among the album synthesized experiments, Fool in the Rain takes front and center. Not only is Fool in the Rain a keyboard heavy track, it also holds the distinction of being the most Latin influenced song in Zeppelin's catalog. Conceived during the 1970 FIFA World Cup, which was hosted by Argentina, the band members, they were absolutely taken with the samba beats that they heard playing throughout the tournament, and they wanted to infuse them into a song. I mean, when you think about it, Led Zeppelin releasing the Samba-driven single, that could have spelled career suicide for the band, like we talked about in a previous episode. But Zeppelin believed in this track, and reportedly, they thought it would be one of their biggest hits. It was always the idea with Zeppelin, was to continually evolve and push the boundaries of what Led Zeppelin could be as a band. And even though it wasn't their biggest hit, Fool in the Rain did go to number 21 on the Billboard Hot 100, and it nearly broke the top 10 in Canada where it went to number 12. It may not have been what Zeppelin fans have been expecting, but it serves as a near final testament to the creative evolution that always characterized this band for roughly a decade. So there it is, my pick for the five defining tracks that tell the story of Led Zeppelin's evolution as a band. Not only do they take you from their beginning in 68 to the close of the 70s, you know, just preceding the passing of John Bonham, and Zeppelin's subsequent breakup, but they also make a compelling statement about Led Zeppelin's phenomenal sonic diversity and their penchant for innovation. So just for a recap, we started out with Good Times, Bad Times, went to Whole Lot of Love, went to Stairway to Heaven, Cashmere, and ended with Fool in the Rain. Those are my five. What are your five? Where did I go wrong? <laughs> what do you think are the five? Who should we cover next? What band or artist should we cover in the five songs in this evolution program? Let us know in the comments below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.